Why, hello. Um, hopefully, my microphone is okay. I'm not super hissy. Seems a little hissy. Anyway, let me know how the microphone level is, and if you can hear me, uh, I can turn up and down, whatever. Welcome to this stream. Um, I was going to go over a couple things. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so uh, one th one thing some folks had asked about in prior streams was what um, what my tools and aliases and my prompt and everything else was. Uh, so I thought I'd collect that somewhere where people could actually see it. Um, and hopefully things look correct here. And I'll put the URL in the chat. Uh, I tossed a bunch of my git aliases, my command line aliases, some of the short uh, git command aliases I've got into uh, this one. Hey, Alexander. Um, and some miscellaneous settings for my git config uh, and my ridiculous bash prompt, which is using the uh, prompt function to get uh, things like the exit code, like if you do that, this exit code two, um, or if, uh, oops, hold on, there, so, you know, exit code with a signal if I kill something, stuff like that. Um, I've been meaning to do, to add Erno into it, except, um, like that, Enoent, which I think would be kind of cool. Um, to expand on that prompt. Uh, but anyway, the um, the stuff that's in there is uh, some of my environmental shortcuts. And I also had to add a directory for my tiny git scripts, which probably I could stick into the my dot .git config, uh, but I haven't yet. I'd, I'd like to move them over there. Because that makes it a little bit easier to manage, although you have to escape some things, so it's uh, one way or the other. Um, let's see. Anyway, uh, so I just wanted to show people where to find that if they were interested. And I have another couple of tools for doing kernel stuff. Um, I've got a like a Coverity building tool that I use for sending the Linux next Coverity stuff. Uh, and the other tool that uh, I use intermittently to varying results is the uh, split on maintainer. Uh, and I'll paste that as well. The split on maintainer script is useful when I have a gigantic tree wide, um, like a, Tree wide patch, you know, some huge monolithic patch that is, that for whatever reasons people prefer to have it broken up by maintainer. Uh, so instead of sending one giant patch, uh, I send, you know, a hundred smaller patches uh, because that's a little bit easier for maintainers to integrate into into the code base, uh, stuff like that. Um, so anyway, that's that's just another tool that I've got in there. Uh, all that should be linked off of. The main off my uh, off the Twitch stream itself, uh, with the info and links, and people had asked about the build system since they uh, noticed the the seventy two cores or seventy two threads I should say, uh, and the RAM. I've actually got some stuff still building right now. You can see four cores are, are in my VM right now. I was gathering some stats on, on benchmarking sec comp inside of Docker. Uh, and this is almost finished. Basically just how long does it take to build a dev config in Docker with its default sec comp filters, in Docker with the sec comp filters disabled, and on bare metal. Uh, and uh, I want, this is mostly setting up to test seccomp syscall bitmaps, which I talked about a couple weeks ago. It looks like there should be a pretty substantial 
speed up. Anyway, that's what those four CPUs are doing right now above my head. Uh, but let's uh, let's dive into the rest of this, which is looking at Alexander's extraction of the slab quarantining uh, routines from the kernel address sanitizer. So let's start over in here and make a, make a look tree. this off of, sorry, we will base it off of, uh, um, I don't remember what the, hold on, let me go get you the, <laughs> link to the thread where Alexander posted the, the series, or we're going to be looking at it. Again, that's in the about link off of Twitch, but here again in uh, let's see if this is the right thread. I should probably test these URLs before I paste them. What I really want is Alexander's. There we go. There you go. And let me actually go update the panel. This panel is entirely busted for some reason. take me to the right place now. Slab quarantine. Okay. Um, right, so I'll, let me get to, here, let me check it out first. Uh, this is going to be RCV2 based on, let's base it on master for fun. Let's see what happens. Uh, no. Why do I always get this wrong? Okay, um, I can get into describing what this is. Quarantine, yeah, the word of 2020. How lucky are we? Okay, so um, if you look from, uh, if you look at Alexander's RFC post, he sort of talks about the, the rationale and where it's coming from. Which is to say that the kernel address sanitizer does a whole bunch of stuff, but one of the features it has is a, a slab quarantine mechanism, where allocations that are freed uh, go back into a, go into a quarantine for a certain amount of time before they get reused. Uh, you know, because in a, in a normal, you know, in, a nor in the normal case in the kernel right now, if the slab allocates, you know, uh, you know something does a K malloc of 128 bytes. And then freeze it and allocates another 128 bytes. It'll, you'll basically get right back what you had let go of. Um, it'll be immediately reused, and there's a lot of good reasons for this. Excuse me. Um, most of that is performance and you know memory cache and all these other things that like this is from a performance perspective pretty useful. Um, so the slab kind of undoes a bit of that, but the hope is that uh, this gives you enough protection on delaying heap sprays, especially across differing differing slabs that might be merged, uh, stuff like that. Um, but that's sort of what I wanted to take some time to look at this because I've never looked into uh, KSAN's quarantine before. Uh, I've seen other 
allocator quarantine designs, uh, but uh, trying to actually get this to work outside of the rest of KSAN, which tends to be pretty heavy, uh, is an interesting idea for trying to make uh, use after free exploits harder to hit or harder to succeed. Uh, but we can we can get to that later. Uh, Jan Horn has some uh, observations about the potential utility uh, of, of this approach. Um, but I wanted to look at sort of the architecture of what's here in KSAN and the extraction and see if I could help um, sort of review how it happened, how it's how Alexander's going about it. Because I think at the very least it's an it's an interesting. Uh, an interesting, interesting layer to add, even if it isn't necessarily something that we can get into a you know by default distro kernel. Um, looking at it, playing with it, letting other people use it um, is I, I think has quite a bit of value because it, it it's a it's a step in sort of the the evolution of adding these defenses into upstream because it's rare when you can get a defense and just throw it at upstream and change the world. Uh, but if you do sort of incremental changes and say, okay, here's slab quarantining outside of KSAN, and now here's slab quarantining a little bit faster, and now here's slab quarantining where we can turn on at runtime, at boot time rather, um, and sort of make our way towards having it a, a, a more powerful mitigation. But the first step is here. So uh, let's go, let's go fetch it. Um, I'm going to use again the B4 tool. Oh, I don't have a link to that. Um, Hey, it's an Elmo. Hey, how's it going? You have a little crown next to your head. Neat. Um, we're going to do an AM straight through, uh, and we'll get anything off the lists. So this is uh, how I normally fetch. Oh, I've never had it. Oh, sorry. I didn't actually, <laughs> I didn't actually redirect it. There we go. So this uh, goes and pulls it. There aren't any. There aren't any. Um, uh, there's a little bit of reviewed by uh, Alexander Potapenko has reviewed patch two uh, since he is the init on free init on alloc uh, maintainer effectively. Um, so he was happy with the change there, and I'll show you that piece as we go through it. Um, anyway. Uh, so if we go back through this and we start with the first patch and say, okay, what do we got here? Um, this is the main first step is the extraction of the slab quarantine feature out of KSAN so it can be built separately. Um, so there's a KSAN header, obviously, that we're going through that has all these pieces uh, defined. Those are being pulled out and moved into uh, sort of one location together uh, where they're um, effectively this is sort of the, I guess the disabled case and then if we have sorry the not, not exactly then if we have case enabled or the quarantine enabled then all those pieces get re redefined redeclared uh, or not redeclared. What font is this? Man, that's a great question. Um, let me see if I can get you an answer on that real quick. Hold on. Terminal preferences. This is not a custom font. This is just the default default font under um, what, ah, under um, I'm running Cinnamon as the window manager, but that is really not what I want. Hold on, settings. I'm sure there's some fan. Oh, mm, FC match. That would probably do it. Thank you. Actually, I do this in a local terminal. One moment. Auto 
Final Space. I don't think it's the... I don't think it's this, but I'll have, a, have it in a second here. Beams, desktop. Is it Beams? No. Uh, man, I have no idea where this is. Windows or desktop. I don't know where to find anything anymore. Um, please, hardware administration. General. No. I'm not sure if the FC... Does FC match actually get me that? I would expect font selection to tell me, but, uh, ah, oh yeah, it does. I didn't load it before. Yeah, it just says monospace regular 11. I wonder, it must be the deja vu sans mono, I guess. Yep, I think you're right. All right, um, I actually like the, uh, there's an Ubuntu monospace font that I like uh, pretty well too. Back to this. Um, so this is basically about visibility under the, the k-configs. Um, what things we want to want to have visible. And uh, all right. So yeah, it is. All right. Thanks, uh, Fox Brown. Um, see, there's this is this week's first newly newly learned thing for me. <laughs> Yeah, that's a fun H tab. Oh, also the build finish. So let's go look at that in a second. Um, so this is pulling out the the kconfig text. So it's at sort of the top level. Um, it's the the free list quarantine. So this is sort of rearranging things uh, so that we can have all those pieces actually build outside of KSand. Um, and then this one. This one says, don't, don't build, no, do build, do look into the case and directory universally. And within the case and make file, turn on the slab quarantine if we have slab quarantine. Uh, this is depends on case and, and slab or slub. So I'm expecting another kconfig section where we see uh, quarantine. Is this moving it out? Yeah, that's ex might be extracting some pieces, but I was expecting to see in here um, if you enable case in, I would expect to see uh, slab quarantine turned on as well. So So for example, here's here's the kconfig change that I see here, which is to create this slab quarantine config. Um, but this depends on not ksan. Um, yeah, I was curious about the so the make file change is the piece that I was trying to look at, which is now we no longer include the ksan directory here, and we only so. This got this got added to the you know make sure you always go into KSAN, which is fine, but then this is the piece that I found a little bit surprising. Um, it's a layer from allocator to quarantine. From allocator to quarantine. So it's basically this. That's KSAN H. So slab underscore quarantine dot C got added, which I assume was the interface. Um, yeah, so I think one piece might be to rearrange some of the configs here. So there's a lot of places where we're doing this, this or test. And it might make sense to have that be just um, config slab quarantine or something like that or, a, or some sort of other config. And then this one, this slab quarantine could be selected by KSAN or something. 
example, but it looks like there's a separate layer. So let me just go look at what the difference is. Uh, so we added so that was always there. This is the new file. All right, so this later providing it without the main functionality. So the idea is there's an alternative. Either you're doing the full case in or you're doing um, this interface. Uh, so that's that's a piece I was a little confused on in the make file. Yeah, that's so the question right now is right now it's that interface is disabled if case in is enabled, and it might be more it might be more clear if we sort of uh, in, you know have the slab quarantine feature be enabled by case and directly, um, and just have the the, a, the internal API selector sort of be invisible. That way, someone can you know can build with config slab quarantine. And they get the feature whether or not they have KSAN. So even if they turn on KSAN, they would still have config slab quarantine. Because that's the bit I'm a little bit confused about on this change the make file is you added um, added slab quarantine, but you didn't add quarantine. Alright, so we still like there's here is the quarantine.c. I would expect KSAN still needs that, I imagine, to build. Uh, and the make file change. Oh, it doesn't change it. I see. Now I get it. Yep. I see. Okay, yeah, full extraction. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, it looks like, um, right, I think that was a piece I missed, which was this right there. So it doesn't actually change KSAN's build, it just changes the visibility internally and says on the outside you can do that, but it also needs the quarantine, and then this is the main interface, the new interface layer, uh, instead of sort of the full-blown KSAN. Because KSAN, I, I, if I understand correctly, all the hooks for KSAN call back, and then the quarantine is sort of in there, whereas this is lifting the quarantine hooks up a level. Uh, so let me go look at, and those hooks are effectively these pieces, the case and slab alloc, et cetera, et cetera. Various things that we're ignoring or doing. So then here is, this is the shared interface. So cache create, malloc large, kmalloc at realx, slab malloc, and then the free. And that's the that's the, the core of that interface. Alright. So that's good. And this is about moving uh, init on free earlier. The idea is uh, things entering the quarantine should be wiped. Uh, so as it turns out, just where that was happening was a little bit later than, than was nice, uh, since effectively there was this quarantining happening at the, the free stage, and then later it was being wiped once it was already in the quarantine. So the idea is we'll wipe it first, then stick it in the quarantine or do the, do the free piece. Um, uh, sorry, Create List, I don't, have any, I don't have any bots in here yet. I hope to add an IRC bot for the chat at some point. Um, yeah, so anyway, this like this is what uh, Glider had responded to, which is like, sure, that's a good place for it too. Um, I think the original thinking was you do the me the mechanics of the freeing first and then wipe it. Um, but 
ultimately the moment that you're let me fill my water um, the moment that you've committed to doing the free it really doesn't matter what order you're really going to do things in so wiping it early is fine um, and I think that leads us to the next yeah we're actually in a great slab quarantine with an it on free which is say we also say we don't want sort of the generic page poisoning we want to have enabled an it on free default on um, although yeah I mean I guess that's fine I mean, we have to enforce it at runtime no matter what so even if someone boots tries to boot with it off it needs to be in, in, enabled um, yeah here's the details on how that goes uh, so instead of the standard and it on free so if someone specifies and it on free I'll go here let me go look at that or let me show you that code do, do, do. Oops. I a sub here, I? Ah, I've broken everything please let me out no. Okay. So the default for booting with the, you know, this is the, yes, that's 72, 72 threads. It's uh, 36, 36 cores, or I don't know, two sockets, 18 cores per socket. Um, so here's the early param for specifying init on free. Um, so you could say init on free equals off or whatever because it's looking at a, a Boolean result here. Uh, but in the case of slab quarantine, you want it on no matter what. Uh, so the idea is you boot with, or the config selects that it should be enabled uh, forcibly, and then this this boot param gets effectively removed. Um, I think I might, I would actually change this around a little bit to say um, I'd include these uh, these build bug ons. Uh, I'd sort of move the config slab quarantine. Might make this look like build bug on is enabled just to get rid of if defs. Uh, if we've got that and this freak out and it is enabled again uh, and freak out because it's not actually an error we don't need to print out we don't need to print out this PR info if someone who has this built in is booting with an it on free equals on um, because that's the state we're in we're fine we, we are okay with that um, so I think what I might want to I think the better change here might be to say, um, like move those build bug ons down into here. Let's say that. And then if we're trying to disable it, I'd expand this logic to say, uh, if this is enabled, say what you want otherwise sure go ahead um, where we basically just ignore it or maybe force on I don't know something like that um, oh yes that's it's a uh, Super dark magic. So yeah, the static branch stuff is is fascinating. Um, let me uh, let me get to that in a second. Um, John free. Anyway, we just take this whole counter wrong. All right. Anyway, so that that puts it all into one code path here. Uh, where we don't end up with the if defs and we allow um, like 
the blue result is on, this doesn't actually do anything. And if it's not, we say, no, you can't turn it off. Um, this, I think, may, this makes the code generally easier to read as you just scan this as the how we process, um, is how we process that boot argument. Anyway, so yeah, static branch enable disable is is a fun one. Let me go show that. Um, so the I, I have some patches that clean this up a little bit as far as how static keys. So there's first there's these keys which are basically an atomic set to true or false, um, and that's uh, used for when you say static branch. Right, so init on Alex, sorry, wrong one. Init on free. And then there's the test. Let me show where the test is, because that's really what we want to look at. Free. Um, basically, every place where you test these keys gets effectively rewritten. Um, in assembly. Oh, let me find a want in it on free. Yeah, static branch. There it is. Slab.h static branch unlikely or likely. Um, so here's basically where you're testing a thing. You're testing one of those. Well, here we go, the actual one that we're working on. Um, we are actually looking at the 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 key that was set, um, and you get the static branch. This is what gets changed. Um, if this gets disabled, this if statement is basically noped out of existence uh, in the kernel text, and things just go straight through. Um, and the the how this looks in in the actual assembly depends on the state of the static branch, likely or unlikely. Um, but the rewriting is listed in, oh, let me go find, go find where this is. Static branch, static keys, staging, why is it in staging? Let's go look at where this is. Staging. All right, I don't know why it's there. But let me go see if the examples are here. Now the documentation, so here's, just for fun, here's the documentation on static keys and branches, but there's actually, I think, a really succinct, um, Explanation of no jump label uh, of how this looks in the assembly. Man, where is it? Ah, here we go. Okay, so each of these starts one way or the other. You can say you've got a key that starts as true and the branch that starts as likely, or you have a key that starts with false and a branch that's likely. And anyway, there's, there's effectively four combinations. Uh, the, the, the type of the, you know, which way this, the key is actually set to true or false initially uh, as built into the, into the kernel image. And then you've got the branch as built into the kernel. Um, so initially you say, let's say the key is true and you have a branch set to likely, then the assembly will effectively look like, you know, there's a there's an op. The branch statements are listed, right? And it's because there's no if, there's no test anymore. It just goes straight into whatever the the statement was, um, because you set the key true by default in the build, and the branch is likely in the build, so there should be no test. You would go straight into it, and then when the key gets switched um, to the using uh, the set, you know, you set it to disabled, right? Static branch disable. You're effectively changing that key from true to false, and now the kernel has to go rewrite its text segment 
to make the change here, which is to say, oh, it's always false. So again, we don't ever do the test because we're always false and we're just gonna insert a jump that skips over all of that, all that code and we jump to the label after. Um, and there's, you know, mild efficiencies on how this happens. Whereas if you say it's out of, out of line, um, so here's the common one, it's unlikely and we start with it being false. Then we just go straight through in all the body of the code, Nothing's, there's nothing in between. And the branch is out of line. And then if you enable that, suddenly you will jump out of line to the statements and then return. Um, it's a really fancy way to, uh, to avoid tests. Um, this, this gets us a lot of cool stuff where we can do boot time settings instead of making a config. It lets you make, uh, you know, build a distro kernel that says, yeah, we're going to turn off all this fancy stuff by default, but for whoever who wants, you know, for all the people who want it, they can actually enable it at boot time. And the penalty is, you know, the penalty for the people who don't want it is zero because it literally just goes straight through and doesn't do anything. And the penalty for enabling it is pretty small. Uh, for the people who do want it, so it's a, I think it's a really clean trade-off, in my opinion. Okay, let's see, where were we? Um, right, so in this case, let's say a distro built with, um, you know, init on free disabled by default, the key would be disabled and the branch is unlikely. So if you looked at the assembly for slab want init on free, it would basically say, uh, nope, return false, and then after that would be the logic for return without, you know, no constructor or C flags, type safe, slab poison. It would basically rearrange the order here. And then if you enabled it, it would say, hey, jump to that test and, if it, and do that thing. Um, I wonder if, well, it's a static inline. It's a little bit awkward to go extract this from the, the object right now and find it, but anyway. Um, Let's see where we are. Go back to looking at the integration of init on free. Okay, so that, that's basically just saying, if you've enabled slab quarantine, you have enabled init on free, uh, which does come with, a, unfortunately, a non-trivial um, cost. Um, yeah, jump labels is, is pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, init on free is using it. Um, the uh, hardened user copy uses that as well uh, for for things. So uh, I wonder if I can see it in here. This is the bypass user copy checks. And this is another one like the static branch unlikely is just return. Don't actually do this check. You can turn this on at boot time. And for the people who want uh, user copy disabled, if they have a work, you know, a work uh, workload that is problematic for them, they can do that. They can boot with hard user copy is false. I don't really recommend that. Um, but some people want to do it. And let's take a look at randomization of the quarantine. Yeah, so this is basically saying uh, things are pretty controllable as an attacker if there was just a static quarantine and nothing ever changes. It just, uh, you just change the nature of your um, of your spraying to, to count out the objects so you can get them back out of the quarantine. Um, and this appears to uh, basically free half of the objects out of a batch as, as it goes. This is a little bit, this is new, so I'm gonna actually read through this a little bit more carefully. Or I should say new to me. Yeah, so again, the, 
if defs, we try to minimize an actual code. So let's go look at this again. How's it called? Batch. Batch. Quarantine batches. Saying that joke does make it work. All right. Um, okay. So adding yeah, adding the if depths like this always. Um, oh, I see. You've got actually a minimum size. You're across an if statement. Um, yeah, that's a reasonable question. Uh, question was why the hard coded 128 for the batches when it's not under KSAN, since it seemed CPU tuned before that. <laughs> I think I might make this um, just, just to avoid, uh, let's see. Can we say Q size? Size equals this. And if is enabled. Although we might want to invert these tests and say um, slab, since that's sort of the feature that we're testing on. Say Q size is equal to T size T. Or we could do it this way. different ways we could do that. Um, anyway, the idea being just trying to um, remove if defs and make it a little bit more readable in code. This tends to be just a, um, a style approach. Um, and I think because this is the common quarantine code, so I think probably the better idea is to switch on slab quarantine instead of config ksan, uh, because this quarantine is used by ksan. Um, so like. on um, let's see. something like that uh, anyway but it might be interesting to to tweak tweak this four times config numbers 20 four times config number CPUs hmm. This is just a cap, though, isn't it? Oh, no. No, it is. Uh, it says do 1024 if we're less than. If we're, no, wait. If 1024 is greater than those the CPUs, then do that. Otherwise, continue to go up. Oh, that's confusingly written in my view. But anyway, um, I wonder if this just needs to be tuned. Like, do you want to go higher? than 128 in the case of, you know, under some circumstances. Actually, what is config number of CPUs by default usually? That's 
actually pretty high, isn't it? Uh, 64 by default. So 256. Anyway, okay. Let's find the next case of config case in. So again, I think I would invert this to slug quarantine and is enabled. This, this is basically KSAN's um, marking that it's been freed. Is that correct? I think. Oh, you know, I should probably go back through chat for a second. Hold on. I know there was another question. Do, 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 do. So, uh, some dude, if you're still here, um, how do you become a Linux kernel developer? Uh, uh, read code in the kernel, find something you want to change, and send patches. I think it's uh, on how to die. That's sort of where I went. I like I like low-level hardware and firmware and stuff. Uh, so I just started sending patches and ended up doing more and more of that work until, uh, yeah, until I did a lot. Let's see. Static labels I've mentioned. Talked about those. Build system requires HP hardware, which you have. Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking about the build system. It's a it's a massive build system because then I build kernels faster. Um, so it's the it's the build workstation that that Google um, makes available to the engineers that are doing a lot of build work so that they're unblocked from having to wait for, you know, rebuilding all of Android or something like that. Um, and the next question is, why am I working on the kernel and not Fuchsia? Um, because there's still a lot of people using Linux kernel. Uh, right, yeah, Joey, that's, yeah, you can build it, it just takes a lot longer. Um, Let's see. I used one there. Um, this one, again, I would say invert this again to slab quarantine. This is in if and if, yes, so then this is config uh, quarantine. So yeah, this is interesting. There is a pretty big difference here. It's been extracted. Um, why are we doing that? All right, this is the randomization bit. And it looks like just different per CPU, uh, because we have, because the batch sizes are different, I assume. Pick a random batch. Quarantine size. So quarantine size, that's the global. 
So I'm curious when I see the write onces and read onces, that says to me that this is getting called by multiple CPUs. Um, I see us updating this value. I'm wondering if there are issues here uh, with parallelism. Um, like this is, this is an open quarantine size here. It's not ripped, it's not wrapped up in a, in a read once. I'd sort of expect, like if, oh, but you're doing a quarantine lock here. Uh, and why the, Curious, it might be helpful to specify what this lock is actually protecting. Yeah. Is the spin lock. But like if you have a spin lock protecting these things, I wouldn't expect you to need are you trying to make this sort of RCU where other people can read quarantine size before they enter the lock? Let's um, go back to looking at the actual thing. Okay, global object. Random. Yeah, getting random. I wonder if get random int is actually heavy for this, depending on your load. Holy cow, they really do. That is massive. District kernels, I, wh why would they do that? That seems, that seems too high. Wow. Um, is there a machine that goes that high that is in commercial use? Uh, I mean, so the thing is it kind of does uh, out of chat like config here? Config on our CPUs gets used for setting a lot. Well, some, none, maybe. I remember it being used quite a lot for setting certain uh, certain arrays. But actually, it looks like hmm, well, I see one. But I know I just I was just looking at it in this quarantine setup. Oh, it's right because it uses right. So here is config and RCPUs being used in a calculation, and then we're going to use quarantine batches to set up an array. So like you end up with a lot of globals and stuff. Um, some globals get the config and RCPUs pushed into them, so you end up using some memory. I mean, t tends to be the correct thing to do is to make a per CPU variable because that's dynamic. Uh, but man, 8192 is a bit high. Yes. Um, well, conf I mean, configuring our CPUs is used for a bunch of, I mean, they're used for all kinds of wacky calculations, uh, maximums to be expected. You know, like you can see doing bit tests for how many CPUs there are. Um, all right, so I mean, I don't know what that driver is, ARM, uh, but, <laughs> and there's a, like, LEDs freak out if you get it much higher than that. I mean, there, there's a lot of these weird hard-coded arrays that end up looking at the number of, the, the, com the compiled number of CPUs. Anyway, it would be interesting, like, it would be interesting to look at um, if you did a PA hole of VM Linux to see all the all the structures, 
I wonder if anything would show up in a diff if you change that. Um, in chat, uh, I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at the memory allocators slab quarantining from the kernel address sanitizer. Uh, there's a series from Alexander Popov that pulls that out, so it's not you don't have to build with KSAN, which tends to be pretty uh, heavy uh, for for a system, so that this can. Uh, having a slab allocator quarantine may help against use after free flaws. So I was just reviewing his series, but I think we've gotten into a bit of a tangent. Um, yeah, that. And if you, on the Twitch about, there should be a today's topics with that piece. Uh, okay, so back to this. So the randomization. I'm going to come back and look at this more carefully as far as the parallelism, uh, because there is there is a spin lock as Alexander pointed out in chat, uh, but there's some unusual like read once, write once uses that I I'm not super sure uh, make make sense. But anyway, um, and then quarantine tests. This is another one I wanted to really look at, which is to say. So what? You've added this mitigation to the Linux kernel. How do you prove that this mitigation does what it says it does? And traditionally for things that are going to completely break the kernel, um, I started stuffing a lot of tests into LKDTM, which is the Linux kernel dump test module, which was effectively designed to crash the kernel. Um, so a success <laughs> out of LKDTM is you broke the kernel. Uh, which kind of inverts things, but it is a way to test uh, for things like the global stack protector. You know, you don't know what state the kernel's in anymore, so you bring the whole system down. Um, which uh, a lot of test systems really don't like the idea of having the kernel fail out from under you uh, as being a success. <laughs> they're not. They're not really wired to invert that test. Usually, having the kernel panic is bad. Uh, but anyway, so this adds. Uh, a heap spray, so sort of a simulated heap spray, and then a, uh, I guess, push through quarantine. I'll read that. Basically, I'm making sure that the randomness and the quarantine itself are unpredictable. Do I often debug the kernel or more often bisect it? Uh, well, if. A lot of things, I don't know, that's a really hard answer. Uh, it is it is rare that I will actually pull out GDB or something on the kernel. That, I'm having a really bad day if that's happening. Uh, most of the stuff is pretty straightforward, or you can you know find the behavior and see what's happening. Uh, bisection is usually a lot, a lot quicker, um, because you see usually it's some behavior you encounter uh, from user space or something. You say, oh, that's not supposed to be happening that way. How did that change, or why didn't I get that right when I was writing it? Uh, but that's part of these writing all these tests is you want to make sure you get the behaviors you were expecting. And then if things go sideways, um, usually by section, um, by sections of course can, uh, especially for memory corruption bugs, can be really really nasty because sometimes you won't actually bisect to a commit that changed something. You'll bisect to a merge. Uh, that happened with a particularly nasty bug somewhere in the like block layer. Uh, scheduler that was uh, didn't show up until you merge two code bases together. Uh, the corruption was still happening. <laughs> like eventually we found the source of it. The corruption was still happening, but you couldn't see it anymore. Like the way it was manifesting didn't manifest until the code was physically arranged in a different way. <clears throat> that's that's when the debugger showed up. I actually ended up starting setting like hardware breakpoints to find like. At what point does this does the value of this pointer change? Because there's nothing in the code that actually updates it. Um, so usually, I'm doing like printf debugging, and then bisection, and then usually uh, push out a. You know, if it's really bad, then you're going to bring GDB or something into it. Um, let me see. So this is a separate, looks like there's going to be a separate KMM cache of the constructor that sprays, I guess. 
because I see a C torus for That's just to make sure it's home. Let me just go to the end here. Uh, sorry, let me go look at the final result in, not in core, went into heap. All right, so here is the spray cache. And it's got a specified a constructor just to keep it from ever being merged. Um, and we'll see the spray item size. Just an awkward one, to, again, to I assume make it not um, collide with anything. Um, so this is going to say, I want get me something out of this cache for uh, which, sorry, at the end it is in that size, so 333. Get me an allocation, set, uh, set bits so I can see it, and free it. And then we're going to do a regular KC alloc, get a whole bunch of pointers. Get a whole bunch more. Set them again. Why would okay. if it's allocated with? Did we just mem set it? The forty-two. Now I'm confused. Alexander, what are you doing here? So this, oh, sorry. I get it now. I'm good. I'm good. Sorry, this is contents. That's the actual address. Um, I'm getting confused by having the um, having it be an array. So here is getting a whole bunch of addresses out of it and saying um, here is a single item. That's the content we filled it with. And yeah, and then we say, uh, sure, set the contents of what we allocated, but look at where we were. Did we get an address out? Don't you want to hold up and cash alloc? Right, so that's just filling it. Um, Spray uh, heap spray is basically as an attacker you don't know you don't necessarily know the layout of the kernel's heap when you're trying to to overwrite some object um, and the idea is you can just fill a heap with as much garbage as you can in a specific uh, size usually and then you can uh, sort of pick one of those to free to make a specific, like a hole in the middle of the huge spray that you made, and then have the kernel follow some allocation path that will force it to allocate into that position. And then from there, you know that somewhere in what you just, uh, you know, the, the one you just freed is actually still, has just been reallocated in the kernel. Um, that's effectively, the spray is a general technique, but how you use the spray changes. Um, okay, so this is basically saying, go in there, get an allocation, make sure we actually got real memory with the mem set. So Alexander, this mem set isn't strictly necessary, right? Um, and check if any of the allocations we just got back out matched the one that we just freed here. So uh, in a normal, normal world, um, this is, well, this is trying to defeat sprays by making sure things don't allocate it in the same place. Um, but yes, ultimately, if an attacker can sort out the patterns for this, um, then they can bypass it. But uh, the goal is to make that extremely hard, if not impossible. Okay, fair enough. Just making sure things, uh, the mem set is for Alexander saying, since the chat isn't visible. Um, um, so it's just for analyzing it after the fact in GDB. Um, yeah, so here's the, the free, and if we actually get back the same address, if we get this back from here, 
then uh, we would expect that the quarantine is not working because you shouldn't have gotten it back from the quarantine. Um, and then we clean up. So this is sort of a way more advanced version of the very, very, very simple version of this that I have. I think I have somewhere here. Uh, da, 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 da. Free. Yeah, so this this is the like super 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 straightforward test where we say we're gonna kmalloc something that's this length and there we're gonna free it and then we're gonna write stuff into it and then kmalloc again and see hey did we actually get did we get this? Did we get the same address back? Um, and this place, if, like if you're actually doing really, uh, like if you had tagged memory or something, this right here might fail. Or if you were doing uh, another software defense, the kmalloc would see it change. Um, What's well, condition of getting out of quarantine? Um, Alexander can speak to that a little better than me, but it looks like it's time and randomness. Um, let's see, let's move on to pushing through quarantine. So this is allocating and freeing. In an unpredictable fashion, right? So this is part of the randomness. Like this is, this, this test actually is looking at, um, whoa. I stall. I'm back. I don't know. All right. I don't know what that was. Yay, internet. Okay, hopefully I'm back. Um, anyway, I was just going to say this. This this test actually gets into, you know, testing the conditions of being released from the quarantine. Um, uh, what would determine? Yeah, the the idea is the. Um, Basically, that was the randomness that got added in the other the other patch. So, sleeping the thread and doing lots of allocation might fill the freed object. Um, in theory, yes, there's a lot more work necessary to sort of trigger the quarantine release. But the idea would be, hopefully, in an unpredictable fashion. But that's part of the. Um, there's an ongoing thread, if you go look at it, um, with Jan Horn talking about some of the limits here. Uh, but I'm, I'm not getting into that debate at the moment. I just want to look through the code and look at the tests um, and sort of talk to style and availability. Um, okay, so this one grabs a small allocation, sets the contents, frees it, and then tries to basically say... What happens now? I'm going to try to allocate and free and allocate and free. And the idea being we want to make sure we don't see it within a certain amount of time or a certain number of allocations. So uh, let's see, I made changes to this. I'm going to undo those changes but keep them around. Um, so I'm going to I actually want to test what I, what I was handed. Let's see. Oh, first of all, am I done with this? I am done with this. Give me one second. I'm going to copy these benchmark results back out, which is I was talking about at the very beginning of this. This is some of the, some of the benchmarking I was doing for set comp bitmaps just before I started the stream. 471, okay. I just wanna get these recorded so that I have them to come back to since this is another task I'm working on. Let us 
けど。Let's go look at the menus. Yep, so, well, yeah, I'll talk about the set comp stuff in a little bit.、Uh, let me go look for quarantine. Slab quarantine. All right, I have page poisoning, I have slub, and I have not case in. So let's go there, look at the help text. Everything looks pretty. I'm going to turn that on. Or, sorry, wait a second.、Uh, I, I wanted to actually do this. I actually want to do this without turning it on first.、Um, so、I want to see this as sort of a stock system first. All right, it's disabled. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'm、uh, in the chat. I'm going to speak to Jan's concerns as well.、Um, he's, he's rarely wrong, per se.、Um, it's more of a question of, I don't know, perceived applicability. Like,、um, there's, a, there's a performance mitigation question that always needs to be asked for some of these things when it's not a, when it's not a hard security boundary, like, you know, non executable memory. There's,、uh, you just, there isn't a way around that without doing something else and using executable memory. Whereas these are more、um, probabilistic defenses. So, you know, if it makes it a one billion shot, okay, that's pretty good. Is the performance high or low? You know, what's the performance hit for getting that kind of probabilistic defense? So、uh, that tends to be where Jan and I differ a little bit.、Um, and I have kind of a different philosophy on. On supporting this kind, these kinds of changes and, and effectively research. Like, you, you can't do you know, revolutionary stuff very easily or often, but you can do evolutionary bits where you say, okay, first step, extract it from case and Next step, you know, make it fast. Next step, make it、um, more generally applicable or something like that. So, that's, that's my thought on, on generally on these kinds of things.、Um, Oh no, Jan just killed it. Yeah, well, that's the way Jan is. But still, I am still interested in looking at this because I get to learn a little bit about how KSAN is working and where the quarantine is.、Um, so,、uh, anyway, I should have just started the build instead of talking about it. Let me go look at the thread, but it should be off the, the main thread that I had linked to. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I tend to use the lore kernel.org URLs,、uh, Joey, just because、uh, they're actually stable.、Um, like they include the message ID, whereas the URL there for lknl.org、uh, doesn't actually get you, doesn't tell you anything about the thread layout. I forgot I have a tool to swap these around. Do, 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 do. It's an L kernel as a service. Do, 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 do. Give me the other one. Spoop.、Uh, I like the lower one because you can, if you click on the subject, you pop down to a thread.、Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the one. Okay, build is finished. Um, let's boot it. Wee! Oh, no, crap. Do I have OKML? Okay, you can install. Yes, I do. Okay, good. I expect to. Alright, so here we are.、Uh, let's do. The how to poke LKD. Oops. That's not what I want. How to poke this. So look for slab. Let's quarantine. Push through quarantine. And what was the other one? 
push through quarantine, and heat spray. Right, so, um, I would expect these to fail, because I don't have the quarantine enabled right now. So what does this look like? We'll basically say, you know, LKDM says, I'm trying this, I got this object, and I allocated another 400,000 of them, and oh my god, immediately the first one that I got back was the, the original object. So that definitely fails. Um, and then uh, push through quarantine, and also exactly fail. Why am I trying to type that? Can you run it without having to use a VM? Uh, yeah, if I had a machine set up to, to boot uh, bare metal, um, which I do for certain tests, but it's a lot easier to boot it into a VM. Um, yeah, so push through quarantine like basically fails in exactly the same way, which is exactly how I'd expect it. So let's just shut this down and go turn on our quarantine. Turn on our quarantine. Actually, hold on. I don't remember if there's right. There's a select that happens. So let's just do. Let's just turn it on like we normally would. Quarantine. Oops. Exit. 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 Yes. Please build. All right. Now you can see. Uh, my poor CPUs. As they go get crushed by the build. Whee! Um, okay, going back, to, uh, while this is building, I can talk about um, the second bitmaps. Right, so I'd... Um, People have talked about bitmaps for SecComp 2, I mean, since the beginning, when Will Drury originally put together a SecComp version 2, he started with bitmaps, um, but maintainers said, well, this, should, this is obviously going to grow, so let's have it much more dynamic. So it was made much more dynamic, and we've kind of come full circle, and the people are saying, ah, this is too slow, like we're running whole BPF threads just to say, go ahead and yes, do that syscall, wouldn't it be better to have, this should be, there should be a better way to make this faster. And back in June, I proposed, like, hey, let's do bitmaps of some kind. And I put together it in a rather fragile, um, but I thought nice way to do um, uh, to do bitmaps by being able to detect if a given filter was looking at anything other than the syscall number itself. Uh, because if it's looking at anything other than the syscall number, that's not going to be static. You can't make the decision unless you run the filter itself. And then... Uh, back in September, uh, another group of researchers, because they proposed the same thing, um, they hadn't uh, noticed my, my June proposal or whenever it was, um, so we tried to smush the designs together to get a, a functioning uh, bitmap system uh, in, in the kernel. So the kernel effectively looks at the filters that get attached and keeps a bitmap up to date as it goes. And I think that should make things way, way faster. Um, yeah, let's see. Yeah, um, UN works. Uh, it's pretty different. I tend to, I tend to be touching a lot of low-level bits, so I tend to need, I need to be pretty close to a functioning CPU emulator, if not a real CPU, a real CPU. So I haven't really used UM. Um, place I know more people are using UM lately for is uh, a new set of stuff that got out of the kernel called KUnit for kernel unit testing. And that will uh, was originally designed to sort of boot into a UM kernel and run a whole bunch of unit tests uh, that get built into the kernel. Um, yeah, QMU with dash kernel. Oh, that's right. I did not include my kernel scripts or my, my QMU script in 
my kernel tools. I would have to add that as well. Okay, uh, we're built. Let's boot it. This is with quarantining enabled, which of course means init on free has been enabled, which means we have to clear all of the freed memory before we continue. Um, there's been a little bit of discussion about, hey, perhaps there's a better way to do this so we don't have to stall the boot here while we're scrubbing all of the memory. I see that there's some debugging enabled. <laughs> Anyway, okay, let's go turn stuff back on here and test it. Uh, so heap spray takes a while because now it does 40,000 tests or 400,000. In fact, can I even find, okay, yep, yeah, there. It does in fact finish. Okay, so here it is performing heap spray and say, cool, I, I never saw it. And then finally push through, oops, it's right here. Apparently it is so far back that we didn't even have it, uh, LKDTM. Well, there's the end of it. Uh, target object is not relocated, so that one is fancy too. So I see all this debugging. I wonder, um, Alexander, did, did you have debugging enabled while you were doing your benchmarking? I wonder, I assume not, but um, let's see, what does this look like? So I just wanted to turn this off. How much did I pay for that workstation? Nothing. Google is very kind to uh, to their developers. Uh, that's this workstation is what Google supplied uh, supplies a bunch. Uh, basically, the people who end up needing to do a lot, a lot of build stuff. Oh, right, the last patch has a debugging. Durr. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I forgot I didn't even make it all the way through. I stopped at LKDTM. Um, thank you, thank you. Goodbye, and rebuild. And we'll come back. Yeah, no, that's good. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Analyze quarantine. I think the global quarantine is dead. I see. So, secondary one. All right, let's see if we're built or built. Let's boot it and go take a look at it. There, now again we pause for this. should be a little bit less noisy. Let me say yes, everything's, everything's delightful. Push the quarantine, the message, same thing. So that's a little bit quieter. Um, and you can see that it failed without this and passed with it. Although, you now in looking through that, uh, we've got, can we use the flush to randomized? So a global quarantine for all slab objects is dead. So the idea is a per per KMM cache quarantine, Alex Alexander, is that right? Per CPU for all objects. Slab. 
Oh, right. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Let's see if I can. Oops. Uh, can we do this by, it should be relatively straightforward to modify. Spray, okay, let's add, let's call it sprayer. Uh, let's call it the flush cache. Uh, flush cache, deep flush. Flush. Okay, uh, let's go look at where we're using the spray cache on heap. Uh, I'll skip push to quarantine for a moment. I think we'll just look at the standard one. All right, cache lock. That's one. So I think we want. Oops, sorry, flash cache. And then we can do this again, but in the standard one, right? Except we don't free them, do we? Uh, hold up. Mm -hmm. Finding allocations with types. Well, it's just the, the question in chat is basically what about dealing with <clears throat> um, a, a lot of a lot of the use after free tends to come from effectively type confusion uh, with the use after free because of how the slabs merge have merged together for things that are the same. Um, the same size, like if, if you asked for a cache that happened to be 128 bytes, you're gonna actually get merged with the K malloc of 128 bytes, that bucket will get merged. And um, <clears throat> while you can turn off slab merging, which would keep them separate, there's still you know, thousands of callers in the kernel that are using K malloc without a specifically separated cache. And the idea would be to actually type separate um, when, you know, when you do a K malloc, if uh, like if you're doing something like you know, um, foo, if you do something like instance equals K malloc size of instance, um, that's going to come out of the same like there there everything else that did a K malloc of a similar size is going to be in the same bucket. Um, but it would be really cool if you could say this K malloc would, you know, right now the API doesn't have this, but it says, okay, what's the type of this thing? So yeah, that's a, that's a struct foo pointer that we're trying to allocate space for, um, or rather a, that is a struct foo we're trying to allocate space for. All of these struct foo allocations should be in a separate cache. Um, that way you can only have confusion within the same type, which is certainly still a bug class, but it gets rid of these sort of cross type uh, issues. Um, right now there isn't a way to do this because we'd have to completely rearrange the API to be something like, you know, kmalloc, what we're assigning it to, and then gfp kernel, and then there's, you know, internally that would go extract the type and do, you know, do a bunch of stuff. So this would require a pretty 
heavy tree-wide reorganization of the entire kernel. And there's plenty of instances where you have functions that are like, um, you know, return k malloc of a thing. And yeah, it gets, or rather, that's that one you can detect because you can know the, the return type of the function. But there's, it gets really ugly really quickly. But if you add a compiler plugin that could do a front end analysis and say, ah, I'm assigning k malloc, the return of the k malloc is being assigned to something, I can figure out what the type is, and then I can separate it. Anyway, the idea would be you could get that into separate caches, and that would be nice. Um, let's see, uh, I'm reading, catching up on chat here. Yes, I'm using tmux. Um, apply. So the question is, are there places in the kernel where people find opportunities to apply traditional math, calculus, linear algebra, abstract algebra, probability, common combinatorials, uh, differential equations. Um, I, I imagine, I mean, there's a lot of data structures. Um, drivers tend to do all kinds of interesting things. Uh, like I know there's, there's some, uh, some math used on sort of, uh, well, I only know it for like keyboard debounce, but there's similar stuff for RF signals and yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. That is not usually an area I'm, I do much work in. Um, other people could speak to that better than me. I tend to look at data structures more than anything else. Um, but certainly sorting and and you know complexity calculations tend, can be very complex as well. Um, for the new test, make sure to pin the caller to a specific, specific CPU. There was a slub for CPU list. I messed up the test. Good point. Uh, I think I can do that from user space. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, void rows. Uh, working on working on a mitigation, a security defense um, that Alexander Popov was extracting from the kernel address sanitizer. Um, oh yeah, crypto's got <laughs> crypto's got lots of math. Um, is it possible to make a career out of writing code for the kernel? Yeah, absolutely. There's most of the kernel developers doing work uh, are employed by somebody. Um, usually stuff tends to be, you know, product centric or distro centric, things like that. Um, anyway, I think if I'm understanding what Jan was saying, uh, as long as I spam one a different cache, I'll get the same order from the other cache. So I think this is that, although I gotta pin it. Um, let's see. Anyway, so this will go allocate from the flushing cache and then put them all back and then come back to the spraying cache and see if I can get, uh, get the address I wanted. Um, and I'm going to... That's not that slow. I won't remember what I'm saying. Let's see what happens. Again, I should have built first and then talked later. <laughs> yeah. What did I call it? Flush cash, flush cash, flush cash. I did everything but actually declare it. <laughs> Again. Did John actually include a demo or was he just describing it? Resources for kernel development. Yeah, I think the um, kernel newbies has kernelnewbies.org is pretty great. I should include that in my about. Um, first kernel patch. Oh, 
I would start there. I'm not using Ccash. I probably should, but um, I uh, I've been I've been burned by bugs in Ccash and other things, especially since I'm now tending to do like mm, compiler development and other things. So I've just not um, I've just not done that. <laughs> I think it works for a lot of places. Um, what is that on my right? Oh, there's that one too. Hey, Gustavo. Okay, this is built. Well, let's boot it again and see if my attempt at breaking it uh, does, in fact, work. Do -do -do, do -do -do. Push through quarantine, heap spray. What does it say? Nope, so that didn't work for me. Or that I did not succeed in breaking it. Heap spraying. Uh, question about Greg Cage's stuff. I have no idea. Oh, right, sorry, thank you. I don't know about Greg Cage's uh, environment. I think my understanding was that Arch is pretty uh, unmodified. They don't tend to carry a lot of patches. Um, let's see, it's the cat. So, yeah, task set zero. Oh my goodness, I don't have it. Too bad. Whoops. Oh, what? There it is in. I can't type, that's the whole thing. How many different ways can I not type? <laughs> Uh, still didn't help. Let's go look at that again. Uh, so yeah, it will apply to LKDTM because uh, so the code, the direct call. So that, yeah, if you look at what we're using, the trigger is this direct trigger. Um, it's effectively a debugfs hook. So when you come in through main, um, oops, nope, LKDTM, core, main, core, whatever, um, you end up with like LKMDTMFs open. These are the crash points that are declared for the direct. Um, and then what happens is you, like that's the current process, like the uh, current is executing into the kernel code while this is going on. So the write that happens in the cat should, oh no, you're right. It's the bash that's, ah, I'm in the wrong place. I'm not, okay, one, two. You're right, because I'm doing a redirection from the shell. Um, so LKDTM is effectively forcing a slab merge disabling. Um, because it uh, declares... Here, I'll show you. In. It declares a separate constructor. Um, and if something's got a constructor, it's forced out of merging. And all these constructors are just empty. They're just there to force it to not merge. Um, so let's see, I got the cat, but I get a redirection, but it is the... Uh, well, here. So, are we not flushing far enough would be the next question. Um, so the spray length, item size. So I get one, I free it. How 
about if I delay freeing it until after I've gotten these allocated. That way we know that this isn't actually holding <laughs> what I just freed. So I free it and then I do cache LX here and then I free them all and then I come back through and do the sprays. I'm going to remove these to speed it up in case I don't know, we got unlucky and the kernel is doing something else. Again, am I sure I want to free them all? Don't I? Because that's the spring, and I want to get um, open suggestions on how to tweak this. So I want to get back to basically nothing, effectively nothing allocated. All right, so I. I allocate this, I allocate the spray addresses, I free the one we're interested in, and then we come and allocate a whole bunch and free them all, and then allocate again out of the spray cache and expect to encounter it because we've flushed it. But the question is, does the spray length need to be longer? Um, that would be my question. And push the quarantine instead of this one. Hmm. Oh, because it's actually freeing in the loop. There's not much difference between the two. Yeah, use another cache for pushing. That's sort of what I'm doing here, but mm, I'm kind of... Uh... Here. This is effectively... Um... Should be the same thing. Only difference is you're not tracking it. Let's see what happens. Thirty seconds. We. Um, Alexander, do you have a sense of how many um, how many uh, alloc and freeze cycles would be needed to flush everything from the first slab back out? Are we just not doing it enough? This thing's got 16 gigs. Oh, 
Uh, so we need to do way more. Uh, 500,000 for two gigs. All right, here, let's see what happens. Let's do two things at the same time. Uh, spray length. So this is 400,000. Oh, way less, I would expect. Um, like we just want to exhaust the quarantine. And we put everything back. Oh, you're saying we don't necessarily... Mm -hmm. Well, let's try it. So the spray saw the item size is pretty small. Um, let's turn that up to five hundred thousand and adjust my memory here. Resources for learning kernel development. Uh, do I assume recommend anything on advanced C programming for low level or high performance? Um, I've always liked the, the Big White Algorithms book, generally speaking. Um, C programming, man, the kernel is like a weird dialect of C, so it's hard for me to recommend anything in particular without just recommending looking at the kernel directly. Uh, oops. So quarantine. Will I even boot? Well, it boots much faster because it has less memory to clear. Do, do, do. There we go. Fail. Attempt zero. Freed object is reallocated. So there we go. Um, that just also means the LKDTM test needs to be tuned to available memory, I think. Uh, so that was, uh, that was pretty good. Right, so you said 500,000 if I have two gigabytes of RAM, so I lowered the KVM RAM available. Um, <laughs> so poof, there it is. Uh, now it's two gigs. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so the, the calculation would be, we just, LKDTM for the future um, uh, would, would do that. So, cool, all right, there, there's the, the general review on extracting from KSAN, which I, I like. Some thoughts on how to use uh, is enabled and, um, and sort of a live proof of Jan's uh, observation of the global quarantine not being quite right. I've seen um, Kern Heap mentioned, but since they don't actually, uh, you know, publish any code publicly, I don't, I don't know anything about it. It would be nice to have something, uh, something better. All right. Well, once again, that magically gets us to two hours. About, about as long as I can talk. <laughs> anyway, let's take a look at the, what the changes here. Yeah, I just made it a little bit faster by getting rid of the mem sets, and we switched and added a cache. So yeah. All right, so the global global won't necessarily work, but we do see how to extract it. But that's good. I think this is is useful uh, to play with. Do, do, do. And um, for anyone who is interested in the very beginning of this, uh, very beginning of the stream, I was talking about the sec comp bitmaps. Um, let me try to find. Um, try to find. Uh, 
tools that I use for. Let's see, standard deviation stats. Right, okay, so here's, so I was doing a benchmark of kernel builds. If I can find them. So bare metal builds, I got a, I did a bit. Um, and here's the runtime is min max. I'm gonna share it with you, this is my bare metal build times for some like a def config kernel build on uh, with no docker no sec comp and then docker with sec comp looked like this see, uh, sorry docker without sec comp um, did I say that right docker without sec comp is similar standard deviations high but you know the the difference between them is within the standard deviation um, it's not great but it makes me think there might be a small cost maybe with the overlay fs and then the part that i found quite horrifying was docker with the default sec comp uh, policy, which was here. And that is measurably slower. That is five times the standard deviation between three, 314 and 328. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, Approaching, it's approaching 10%. It's kind of crazy. Um, wait a second. Um, oh, right. Do, do, do. Catching up on chat. Um, right, so yes, that's already been answered. <laughs> Thank you. The my prior streams are up on YouTube. I think uh, feedback would be appreciated. I think I got the right. I don't know encoding levels or stuff, um, so that you can actually still read the text because there were some defaults that were very bad. So um, Docker with seccomp bitmaps would be the next one to actually get stats on, which is where I am right now in that work. Um, but I had struggled with <laughs> getting Docker set up again inside, uh, running a container inside a VM. Uh, anyway, I had to grow the partition a bit because I tended to have really thin ones. I don't, uh, I don't have any Ubuntu specific OS tips. Uh, I, I use uh, Debian and Ubuntu. <laughs> QMU inside VirtualBox. Well, clearly you have to now install Docker inside QMU in your VirtualBox. Okay, uh, let me see if I actually had, I don't know if I had a tree in there. <laughs> Apparently now we're gonna get uh, emulator wars <laughs> in chat. I think I used VirtualBox once. Anyway, so I guess this is my cliffhanger. I do not actually have stats yet for the second bitmaps uh, enabled, but I wanted to get these runtimes established. So I had run a couple of these uh, over last night and this morning while I was getting set up. And these, um, the last one uh, with without seccomp enabled in Docker is uh, what it was just finishing up at the start of this one. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, so, I basically, uh, I'll, I'll probably post about this um, because I want to, I definitely want to get this nailed down. This is just not something I had um, I'd noticed before. People had talked about it, but it makes me think that something, some of the filters started stacking or something, making it especially a lot slower. 
Uh, I think there's certain workflows or workloads, I should say, that are more heavily hit by this, and I think um, kernel builds is a big one. It's very uh, file system and memory heavy. Um, let's see. Oh yes, we're continuing virtual box discussions. I am. I really do want to get these build tests started again, though. But I'm in. I just go co recopy these notes so that I have them. I don't have to paste them all around again. Do -do 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 -do. Okay. I think that's where we were. And I was still looking at. I was preparing for um, doing pull requests for next next week when the merge window for the 5.10 kernel opens. Expect it to release. Um, expect 5.9 to release uh, this coming Sunday, assuming nothing horrible happens. Uh, but yeah, I think um, probably I'll. Uh, I might. I don't know if people are still around this afternoon. Maybe I'll kick on a stream for me to do um, seccomp bitmaps. If anyone's still around and interested, maybe in an hour so I can go grab lunch because I certainly want to mess with it, but uh, it takes a while to run the benchmarks just so I can have some sense of things being okay. But anyway, I might do another stream today. Uh, I'll, I'll wave my arms on Twitter or something, but first I'm going to go get lunch because I'm hungry. Uh, thank you for spending your time with me. Um, thank you, Alexander, for showing up. I know uh, it is probably not time zone convenient for you to be here, so I appreciate it. Uh, this has been uh, pretty great. We sort of did a full circle on, on taking a look at it and helping and Jan helped us direct what we wanted to do um, to test it out at the end. So uh, like it was super easy. You already had tests in place so we could modify those uh, for other other ideas. It was really good. This really shows why we want to have the testing because uh, we can do that. Um, anyway, so thank you all. Uh, I'll uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.